is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Fire and Hemlock by Diana Wynne Jones, Part Two, Chapters Three, Four, and Five. In this section, what's going on with Polly and Seb? What's that about, guys? Is that is this what I think it's it is? Welcome to spoil me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha, and thank you again very much to Patricia for commissioning this episode. Uh, Patricia, I believe that I, during the live re- or the live uh, broadcast last time, called you Priscilla at one point. My apologies, um, but I corrected it when I edited the recording. I was just like, oh god. Um, so yeah, it's Patricia, everybody. Just to clarify, and. Uh, Yeah, this section of this book was a lot, like, everything is so much more slow moving than I expected with the story. And I do not mean that in a bad way. Usually when I say those words, I do mean it as like a negative. But that's definitely not the case here. I'm actually kind of pleasantly surprised that something that is paced as slowly and deliberately as this book is manages to fully keep my attention the way that it does. That's a tough thing to accomplish. And it's something that, you know, there are times where something can be slow paced and you're able to like focus and it's still got your attention, but there's a part of you that's going, you know, this all better pay off. And I don't even feel that way about it. I feel like the, the deliberate pacing is the payoff. Like this is part of how this story is supposed to work. Um, <laughs> the, what I keep thinking of is uh, I covered for the book club last month, the dead zone by Stephen King, which I actually enjoyed, but there are really huge slow moving parts to that book that it got a little frustrating after a while. Um, and I think that they paid off, but whether or not they paid off enough to justify these huge swathes of, kind of um, downtime is the only way I can describe it. And if you read it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, That remains to be seen. I think it really depends on the person. And uh, I'm still not quite decided on that. But anyway, so there's a few things um, about this section that I really enjoyed. One of them is I like Polly a lot. Um, I feel like her personality is written in such a distinctive, clear way that can be very hard to get across with young children characters because, you know, kids are still developing and they aren't necessarily consistent in what they believe or in what they, how they react to things. And uh, there's, uh, that can be really tricky for writers that are more plot driven and not necessarily character driven to zero in on if they don't know how their care. And I think that, that's something that Diana Wynne Jones has been really good at with Polly is being like, yeah, she is kind of inconsistent actually, but that's because she's a child and she knows that, that, you know, within that inconsistency is still like um, a consistent type of mindset or process of thinking. And this will lead to different reactions because she's still figuring out who she is and what's appropriate, but it's, its own kind of personality. And that's, um, I feel like she's really accomplished something there. So the first moment, um, that got my attention was Polly talking to her grandmother, um, about sending him a Christmas gift and like Polly sending Mr. Lynn a Christmas gift because she feels a little bit bad that she's kind of neglected him the way that she has. And yet he's still sending her all kinds of stuff. And, when she's talking about it with her grandmother, um, she says it's bound to be late. And I dare say he's a bit old for it, but they say it's the thought that counts. Granny said, as they came back from the post, why are you always like that about Mr. Lynn? said Polly. Like what? said Granny. 
Sort of sarcastic, said Polly. Why don't you like him? Like, that's pretty ballsy, honestly, for a kid to just ask that. And I, you know, kids, there's a, like jokes about how kids will say the thing that other people won't say. But a lot of times that sort of thing can be about like um, something that's a lot more obvious. And this is a somewhat subtle, like that sentence where her grandmother's saying, I dare say he's a bit old for it and yada, yada, yada. That's not necessarily a sentence that most kids would zero in on as being like sarcastic and a little snide. They wouldn't all pick up on that. So she picks up on it and not only notices, but says something about it and is very like confrontational in a way that I admired. I'm not sure that I would have been. I don't know. Um, and his her grandma says, oh, I expect he's well enough in himself. I just have my reservations about the company he keeps. Since Polly knew exactly what Granny meant about the Leroy Perrys, she did not say any more. She just went quietly back to the paper chains she was making. So it's Christmas time now, and Dad comes to stay with Grandma. And there's like a kind of heartwarming scene where, despite Polly's dad not being a real great father... He is, like, making an effort here, at least, and it's something that's very sweet to read. Um, Polly forgot the new wrinkles round his eyes and the gray threads in his curls and romped with him as if she were five years old. Um, and he asks her to play pretend a couple times, and she says no, that she doesn't do that anymore. And it's really clearly because of a combination of her now she shares that with mr lynn she kind of replaced her dad in that respect which is an odd feeling to realize you've done that when the person you used to do something with asks you to do it and you are like oh no that's not yours anymore um and also because there's an association i think in her head between pretend playing pretend and the fire and hemlock picture which i think is a valid association I still don't know what that association is or how that makes sense or how it works, but I understand why it's there in her head and I do not blame her for it at all. Um, and the conversation that she overheard while she had snuck into the house, she just like kind of forces herself to not think about it because the whole situation was so strange combination of what they were talking about and she, her not really understanding the extent of that, but also the fact that, you know, she could clearly hear them and yet there was nobody there. That's a really, I mean, I don't think a lot of us would go out of our way to think about that too much if we could help it because it's creepy. You have a, you hear an entire conversation and yet once you walk downstairs, there's absolutely no one there and no footprints or cars or anything to indicate that anybody was ever there. Yeah, I don't really blame her for putting that out of her mind either. Um, and there's a, an adjustment that she makes again. Every time that we talk about the fire and hemlock photograph, she sort of changed what she thinks the photograph is of. So... This moment is, um, up to now, Polly had assumed they were trying to put the fire out. But this Christmas, it began to seem to her that the people might really be trying to keep the fire going, building it up furiously, racing against time. You could see from the clouds of smoke that the fire was very damp. Perhaps if they left off feeding it for an instant, it would fizzle out and leave them in the dark. Um, meanwhile, Polly still has the photograph of this boy that she stole from the house. The uh, the photograph is like old and fading and yellowing a little bit. Um, and she doesn't know who he is. She doesn't understand why there's something so familiar about him. But she's really obsessed with it. She like keeps going back to it and looking at it. And uh, from some angles, his cheeky look reminded her of Leslie in Thomas Piper's shop, but he had the wrong hair to be either Leslie or Seb, too fair and long and untidy for Seb and not curly enough for Leslie. Besides, he was older than both of them. Polly decided she simply had not met him yet. She hid the photo carefully inside her school bag before she went to sleep because Dad was using the camp bed in her room. I'm wondering if this photo is Mr. Lynn, but I don't have any idea. I feel like if it were, she'd know. I don't feel like, you know, 
somebody looks so different as a kid. He's older in this photo than Seb is right now. So this is a photo of like a 15, 16 year old kid, I guess. And there's no way that he looks so different now than he did then that he's unrecognizable. Right. Um, so the days passed. Ah, oh, well, said dad back to Joanna again, I suppose. Wow. Restrain yourself from your wild, unbridled enthusiasm, sir. Polly went home to Ivy and David Bragg and took her photograph with her, but she hid it in her folder with the soldiers and hid the folder in the cupboard where the cistern glopped. She did not trust Ivy not to throw it away. You forgot to give David a Christmas present, Ivy said, handing her a parcel from Mr. Lynn. Y'all, if there were a way, like, if somebody t asked me, what fictional character do you wish you could go into a book and give a sound slap in the face? I think people would expect me to say something like Ramsay Snow from Game of Thrones or it would be Ivy. I hate her so much. Oh, God, it's like. I just hate her so much. You're criticizing your daughter for not giving your boyfriend a Christmas present, which, first of all, when kids give Christmas presents, you know who's giving that present? The kid's parent. That's who gives the Christmas present with the kid's name on it almost always. Maybe the kid puts their name on it and picks it out, but the parent pays for it and is, like, responsible for remembering that. And you forgot your daughter's fucking birthday, you dumb cunt. I'm sorry, but I hate her so much. I want her to just evaporate. I just want her gone. Polly would be so much better off. I hate her. Oh, God. It's just like it consumes me when I read these. It's so awful. Like <sighs> Polly had not meant to remember a present for David, so she pretended to be absorbed in opening the parcel. Yes, Polly. Ignoring that fucking sentence is the best possible way and most mature, I think, way to handle it. Because frankly, there is no good that can come of talking to her or responding to that. Like, what the actual fuck? You dumb, horrible woman. Ugh. Um, so, yeah. Polly supposed King Arthur was all right, but fairy stories... Still, she was sure, without wanting to think of Mr. Leroy, that Mr. Lynn had things on his mind, and she tried not to blame him. Um, so the next section is about school starting again, how Ivy is just really, like, over the way that her mom is simpering and, like, catering to David all the time. And I wasn't sure what we were supposed to think of David for a minute here, because He's not really part of this story. It's all about Ivy and the way that Polly is perceiving Ivy. And then we get some more info about David. And while I'm still not 100% sure what to think of him, I believe that if he is frustrated with Ivy and sees how unreasonable she is about things, that he has to be a better person than she is. And he also likes Polly, but also pretty sure he has a bad gambling problem. So, you know, that's not a situation that you necessarily want to get involved with either. Um, so Mr. Lynn gets the uh, Christmas present that she sent him and um, he asks if she can come and visit. And initially she thinks that maybe she can. And then her mother is just like not interested in paying for him to see like she, she her mother is going up to um see her lawyer still because of the divorce, but she has, she would have to pay extra to bring Ivy with her and she doesn't want to do that. So it's David who actually helps Polly get there. And this is something that I'm going to give you a theory. I'm not sure if we're supposed to like know what's going on here or if, if, if it's meant to be a little puzzling still. But I'll read you this part. Oddly enough, it was David Bragg who paid Polly's fare. Polly did not understand quite why. It seemed to happen because she met him by accident in the middle of town the day school broke up while she was walking home with six friends. David was across the street talking to a lady. Polly looked at them because the lady David was with seemed to be Mary Fields. She was not Mary Fields. Polly had lost interest and was turning away when David suddenly waved and came bounding through the puddles on his rather short legs. Hello, Polly, he called. Polly had to stop and talk while her friends stood waiting impatiently and getting wet. 
Polly, David said earnestly, I've long felt you deserved rich rewards for sanctity and forbearance and all that jazz. Is there something you haven't got that you'd like to have? Speak up. Sky's the limit, and so on. Um, I'm, okay. So here's, I said earlier about his um, gambling, which I think is clearly a problem. Excuse me, I'm sipping some tea, everyone. Um, But this moment felt more like she caught him with another woman. However, I have a hard time believing this dude would be that careless to be like hanging out with another woman in a suspicious manner, like right out on the street where kids can walk by and see. Maybe. I mean, you know, people don't always like think things through and make good decisions. But it that just seems like such an easy way to get caught. Um, and there's no like description of the the body language of him and this woman, Mary, that he's talking to. Um, but the way that he says you deserve rewards for sanctity and forbearance does make it sound like I'm giving you money to keep you quiet. So I'm like, is it that is this person that he's talking to, even though it's a woman and the first thing that you think is that he's having some kind of affair Maybe she's somebody involved with the gambling as well. You know, I don't know. Um, Maybe somebody that he owes. But he put an envelope full of pound notes into Polly's hand that night. And uh, Polly had a vague feeling he expecting something in return. If only she could understand what it might be. But she did not let ignorance stop her taking the envelope. Yeah, good for you, girl. Get it. Get it. But yeah, I assume I like I feel like he's just wanting her to not say anything. It does seem sort of weird that he wouldn't, I mean, that he's just going to give her the money and assume that she knows that he wants her to not say anything without making it a little explicit. Um, Or maybe it's just that he's like trying to suck up to her. Maybe. I don't know. Like, because a lot of men, do believe that if they're interested in a woman with children, that getting in good with the kids is like the smart tactic, which I frankly think is smart. I really do believe that that's a good method. Um, Not necessarily, you know, morally a great idea, but I think it works. Um, Except if you are, you know, a crazy person who has jealousy issues regarding her own child, like Ivy, and then it doesn't work great. But nevertheless, um, Polly goes and sees Mr. Lynn. We don't get like closure on this. Um, And I love this whole thing because he's still driving like a fucking madman. And there's this moment of uh, they shot into traffic, squealing on two left wheels, cut in front of a bus, tipped a cyclist neatly into the gutter and dived between two taxis through a gap that would have been small for the cyclist. But the taxi drivers knew a hero when they saw one and sheared off, honking their horns. <laughs> I bet they just do. Um, so the, uh, oh, let's see. Oh, do you get killed often? Polly said. Old heroes never die, said Mr. Lynn. But I do rather surprisingly often drive the wrong way up one way streets. I think I am now. Uh, so this is when Polly asks him if he was in Middleton at Christmas. And he's really surprised and it's like, no, I mean, if I'd have been over there, I would have said, like, stopped by and taken you out or done something with you. And she's like, well, I was at the, I was staying at Granny's and I thought I saw you, Polly said carefully. Mm hmm. I'll just bet you were careful about it, Polly. I can't be like, I broke into the house and I swore you were walking around. Um, he says he wasn't there and I believe him from the way that he, like says it to her. There's no evasiveness evident in the way this is written. Um, Did you see Mr. Leroy at all? Polly asked. I thought I saw him too. I did run into him just before Christmas. Yes. Mr. Lynn said carefully and with just a touch of grimness. It reminded Polly of the way dad talked about David Bragg and he changed the subject by asking about her stay at granny's. Um, So, uh, they get to his house and 
there's the little moment with her like running into Carla again, his downstairs neighbor, and Polly asking, "Is is uh, Carla a one parent family?" Not quite, Mister Lynn said. I think there are several Mister Carlas. It's rather confusing. Oh," said Polly, and felt childish after all. Mister Lynn gave her one of his considering looks. People are strange," he said. "Usually they're much stranger than you think. Start from there, and you'll never be unpleasantly surprised." Yeah, I think that's a pretty valid way to go through life, to be honest. Um, so then there's the um, so this is what I'm I'm talking about, and you know I know I keep relating so much of what is going on with Polly personally to like how I was growing up and a lot of how Polly is, is not like me at all, but there are moments like this. Um, he was behaving cheerfully enough, but he was not happy. She knew the signs from Ivy. There was a sort of effort going into his cheerful remarks. She could feel the pushes. She decided not to say anything about it. She knew how useless it was with Ivy when she was in a mood, but Mr. Lynn was not Ivy without intending to. She said, what's the matter? Are you very miserable? I really like this a lot. And this is actually something that um, I was just talking to my therapist about yesterday. Um, as if you are somebody who is empathetic and is good at reading people, which I tend to be, um, I was good at it even as a child, although I wasn't always able to interpret what I was picking up the same way, of course, as I am now. And it can be a really tough thing to like be around somebody who is faking either happy, faking anything and you're aware that they are and you really have no like right or opportunity to say anything about it. So you have to play along. It's a strange feeling and it's, it's strange when you're an adult as well, but you grow used to it because it happens so often throughout life that by the time you're a grown up, you're like, yeah, there are just going to be times where you have to fake it and that's just life and whatever. And you are able to do that much more easily when you're a kid and an adult is doing it. It's, it can be really like almost scary because, you know, without a lot of context clues or understanding about what else is going on in this person's life, you can assume it's about you that obviously they're upset about something and they aren't talking about it and they're mad at you or you did something like that hurt their feet or anything, you know? And um, as you get older, you start to like realize a lot more than you used to that it's probably not about you, but that doesn't necessarily make it easier to cope with. And there are people like Ivy who aren't even necessarily like while Ivy may force cheerfulness, she's, not doing that for the benefit of her daughter. Like this isn't somebody who's just trying to pretend everything is fine to keep Polly happy. She's doing it to fool herself and other people and is fine. We've seen with letting Polly know that, you know, somebody has upset her or done something shitty or that she's angry or like she will tell Polly, frankly, much more than she should as a parent about the intimacies of her life And so I think that's another thing is that um, I had a parent that could be like really easy to read emotionally and it never really felt like they were faking like being cheerful for my benefit necessarily. It felt like they wanted me to ask what was wrong, to be honest. And I would feel the same way that I have felt reading these chapters, which is that you need friends. You need somebody to talk to. The fact that you are weirdly angling in this subconscious way for me to ask you what's going on is weird. And this isn't the relationship that we should have. I didn't have the words to put to it as a kid, but I look back now and I'm like, that's totally what it was. I was just like, I can see what's happening here and I'm not interested. Like, no. Um, Yeah. Thank you. Patricia's saying Ivy needs adult friends. Indeed. Um, So that's what's going on here, except that she decides to just straight up ask him and he actually straight up answers her, which, hey, that's new. So he says, mostly I'm worried and undecided about something. 
I'll tell you about it, boring though it is. But there's something I'd like you to do first. I've got quite superstitious. So here's something really cool and weird. So they have this like, you know, um, quartet of heroes in this pretend story that they're making up that they've given all these different names. Um, Tan Hanavar, Tan Thayer, Tan Audell are the other three. Um, and he's Tan, Tan Cool. And he asks her if he showed her a picture, would she be able to pick out who they all are? And this is such an interesting thing because like this indicates that they all are sort of accepting at this point that the, the things that they're pretending are real in some way, even if they don't really understand how both of them are like treating it that way now and not really talking about what that means. Um, but weird, right? Like I'm just, I have so many questions about this. Um, so he shows her a picture of the British Philharmonic Orchestra um, and asks her to pick everybody out. And she's able to do the first two, Tan there, um, and then uh, what's the next one? Tan Hanavar. And she has a really hard time with Tan Adele. And finally, she's like, I'm sorry, I just don't see him. And Mr. Lin says, have you considered as a female assistant hero yourself that Tan Odell might be a woman? As soon as he said it, Polly knew he was right. Oh, good heavens, she said. I never thought. Of course Tan Odell was a woman now, she thought. She even knew dimly some of the things Odell, Tan Odell was famous for. She went back to the photograph, scanning the ladies in dark dresses she had been ignoring up to then, very much ashamed of herself. And there was Tan Odell at last. I really like that moment because that is something that like, you know, internalized misogyny and like um, just in gender roles or ideas about gender and, you know, just generalized sexism that you've been uh, socialized to believe is a very tough thing to shake, even if you are somebody who is brought up in a, a pretty good situation like my mother was super feminist and i still you know that riddle where it's like a boy comes in uh to surgery after being in a terrible car accident and the doctor says i can't operate on him that's my son but the father is standing right there if that's his father then who's the doctor and it's like this really simple riddle the doctor is his mother but the the trick about it is that a lot of people are like, I don't know, who is the doctor? That doesn't make sense because we assume doctors are men. There's no gender description of the doctor. We just use the word the doctor and the immediate image we get is of a man. And I remember somebody like reading that riddle to me. I think I was like 11 or 12 years old and they told me the answer and I just sat there fucking dumbfounded because I really fell for it. Hook, line and sinker, like the punchline. Once it came, I was like, I can't believe that didn't even enter my mind. What? Um, and it's just, you know, there are little moments throughout life like that, that you like realize all of the preconceived notions and prejudices that you have that you don't think are there. And, and then something will happen that, throws it into such sharp relief. There's absolutely no denying that it's there, but you really thought that you were better than that. And uh, I really like this moment with Polly where she's just like, oh my God, of course it's a, what the fuck is the matter with me? Like, that's just very relatable. So she picks out the woman, um, a uh, strong squarish face with strong square black hair. Ten Odell was not pretty, but she looked nice. Mr. Lynn leaped up with a shout. Anne Abraham, you've done it, Polly. You truly did it. I can hardly believe it. So he tells her that he's been thinking about starting a group 
that's oh, like not part of the Philharmonic. He's getting a little bit tired of doing the Philharmonic and traveling and all of this stuff quite as much as they do. And he wanted to start a group and he wasn't sure who he should pick to do it with him. And he knew that it was going to be tough and it's a huge risk because it's not like you can leave the London Philharmonic and if it doesn't work out, you just come back. Like, there are a hundred people playing, like playing the instrument you play, waiting in the wings to be put in the spot that you vacate, and um, it's just an enormous risk that you take that you leave and you don't have anything like the kind of success that you had with a steady job with the Philharmonic, and you rue the day you ever made such a stupid decision. And he had been sort of banking on whether or not Polly was able to pick them out of this picture that if she didn't, he would tell himself that it wasn't really worth the risk and they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't break off, but she picked them all out. And uh, he feels now that it's a combo of like, I'm really excited because this do you doing this makes me feel like it's totally meant to be. But also I was scared enough that if you hadn't picked the right people, I would have been a tiny bit relieved to not have to take this risk, which I totally get. Um, and then here's the thing. he uh, If we wanted to form a proper quartet, we're going to have to leave the orchestra and try. But it's also possible we'll end up busking in the underground a year from now. I thought I'd sell another picture. I thought it must be a reproduction or at least a copy. But it turns out to be a real Picasso, pink and blue clown picture. He added, sounding unhappy, it's not money, though. It's, well, are we good enough to foist ourselves on the public? That made Polly turn back. Granny says the only way to find out is to try, she said. I say that, too, she added, thinking about it. Um, so, yeah, I really like this. Like, what a strange, and I'm hoping that Polly gets to meet all of these people, um, although there is a wrench thrown in his plans by Mr. Leroy a little bit later. Um, the rest of the day was a great golden excitement to Polly. She had never been anywhere much in London, so it was all new and wonderful to her. Whether she was in the horse car screaming round and round the roundabout in front of Buckingham Palace because Mr. Lynn kept missing the road they wanted, or heroically belting along the embankment, or looking at the crown jewels in the tower, or eating kebab somewhere beyond that. Now Mr. Lynn was happy again. They talked and talked the whole time, but Polly only remembered snatches of what they said. She remembered being in front of the Houses of Parliament, eating a hot dog. She looked up at Big Ben and said suddenly, Tan Cool and the others have to be on a quest for something. Do you insist? said Mr. Lynn. Yes, said Polly. All the best heroes are. Very well, said Mr. Lynn. What are we looking for? Polly replied promptly, An Oba sipped. But when Mr. Lynn questioned her, she had not the least idea what an Oba sipped could be. I don't know either, guys. It sounds Egyptian. I feel like it's like, a, you know, what are those canopic jars filled with somebody's brains? <laughs> um, I guess the brains were thrown away, huh? They kept the heart, but not the brains. Um, but yeah, I have no idea what that is. So this is something that they keep like going back and forth with, like asking each other, what do you think it is? Do you have any idea what it is yet? I think it's got jewels on it. I think it's, you know, it's a container. Eventually they do get to that it's a container, um, to, which I think really just validates my whole canopic jar theory. So FYI, I'm pretty sure I figured this out. Um, Mr. Lynn asked if she had liked the books for he sent for Christmas. And she said, King Arthur's all right. And he says, oh, so you haven't read the fairy stories? And she doesn't really answer. And he says, please read them. Only thin, weak thinkers despise fairy stories. Each one has a true, strange fact hidden in it, you know, which you can find if you look. All right, said Polly. Um, that is a way that I do not relate to Polly because I ate up fairy stories as a kid every kind of story, but I really, really loved like, you know, Celtic fairy tales and old legends and stuff. Um, so they're running late to catch her train home and they're sprinting towards it. Uh, you know, the way you got the car to start is the only peculiar thing that's happened this time. I forgot that that part that it breaks down and he has to like pull over um, kicks it and prods it and just kicks it again. And then finally it gets going. Um, and 
famous last words he says, and then here comes Mr. Leroy. Um, fucking Mr. Leroy just sounds so awful. Um, he's with Seb, and Seb has grown about a foot since the last time that she saw him, and treats her in a different way than he had in the past. And this is the very first indicator we get that maybe Polly looks different too. And this starts to become more of an issue throughout the the next chapters that Seb is treating her with slightly more respect, talking to her in a way that he hadn't talked to her before. And one could say that it's about how she looks. It could also be about the fact that Seb is maturing a little bit, maybe. But I tend to think it's probably more the first thing. Um, and... Mr. Leroy, like, sends her off packing with Seb because he's going to be taking the train back as well and corners Mr. Lynn. And I'm really curious if this, like, conversation that he has with Mr. Lynn here is the conversation that she heard in the house, like, days ago. Um, if there's some sort of weird time thing that's happening there. But, yeah, this is just such a weird, like... Because it's not until later that she hears that Mr. Lynn tells her about the uh, photo or the painting and the fact that um, he could keep the one that he had as long as he didn't sell it and that he was going to need to like pay them back for part of the other one. And um, that sounds like part of what the conversation had been while they were in the house. So... Yeah, I don't know. But then there's the fact that when she asks him, Mr. Lynn, if he saw Mr. Leroy, he says yes and changes the subject. So there was some kind of conversation that had happened already. So maybe I'm just like putting too much together there. Um, and getting back to her and Seb in the train car, um, he smokes in the train car, which like impresses her very much. Cause it makes him seem like he's super adult. Um, and let's see. The only thing she wanted to say were to ask about Mr. Lynn and why Mr. Leroy did not want him to see her. She was sure Seb knew why, but she did not dare. It was maddening. She seemed far more afraid of Seb now than she was when she was 10. Um, so then she starts talking about music and, is surprising herself at the fact that they are having a pretty normal, reasonable conversation. Um, there's a disco at my school at the end of term. You could come if you're interested. Polly was so flustered at this that she said, I'd love to, and then wondered what had made her say it. Seb said he would let her know when it was. They got off the train and walked out of the station together into the dark and windy forecourt. See here, he said quite kindly. I warned you off a bit a year and a half ago. You didn't take the blindest bit of notice, did you? No, I didn't, but you hadn't any right to anyway. You should have listened, said Seb. You've got my father angry now, and he can be quite vile when he's angry. You'd better be careful from now on. Very careful. That's all. Want me to walk home with you? No, thanks, said Polly. See you. Um... So it's interesting, you know, he's still warning her, but it's not with the same sort of like bizarre, he doesn't feel like last time he warned her, he was standing outside the house, staring up at her. Like it was a very weird feeling like he was his father's like henchman or something. And here it just feels like he's his father's kid warning somebody about what a dick his dad can be. It feels much more normal. So... I'm just curious if like things have changed between Seb and his dad. Maybe if, you know, the fact that he's gotten to, cause you know how that is. You think everything of your parent. And then as you start to get older, you're like, wait a minute, you're kind of full of shit. And I'm not sure I want to be your BFF anymore and do all of your dirty work and stand outside people's houses, threatening and watching them. So it might just be the fact that he's getting older and just like not as easy to manipulate and order around as he used to be. Um, but anyway, so, um, Mr. Lynn telephones about a week later and she can tell that he's upset and, uh, he says, 
you know, it turns out that it was a Picasso. It seems we somehow got all the wrong ones. They've just found out Laurel's been on to me and Morton Leroy, and they're trying to trace the one I sold to buy the horse. Of course, I've had to give the Picasso back. Um, and does that mean you won't have any money to start your quartet with? And he says, I'm afraid not. Um, all the pictures, the Chinese horse and the musicians too. I can keep those two on condition. I don't sell them, but I've had to give the carnival picture back with the clowns. It's fair enough. It was a mistake. I'm just realizing. So the Chinese horse picture is the picture that they were talking about and then like really looking at before he runs into the horse that had escaped the carnival. Um, the carnival picture with the clowns, he has to give back. So that's a carnival picture, which is where the horse escape from. And then the musician's picture he can keep. And that's the one with musicians, which is what they just went through her choosing people for him to start a quartet with. These are all, how does this work? How does that work? The, all the paintings are related to things that they're actually doing and talking about and like imagining up and, Oh, guys, I'm dying here. Um, you're not going to stop doing your quartet. Not now you've decided. You mustn't. Thank you for saying that, said Mr. Lin. That's why I rang, really. I am going on with it. The others have said they'll risk it. But it means I'm going to be very occupied for quite some time, trying to get people to listen to us. And I'm not going to have time to see you or think of hero business or even write very much. I'm sorry. I see, Polly said miserably. This is a goodbye call. Oh, no, 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 said Mr. Lynn, but she could see it was, even though he added, by the way, do you think an opacip is a sort of container of some kind? I see it as a small jeweled file. A little vase with a lid, said Polly, carved out of one precious stone and worth a king's ransom. It, it may be. What's in it, though? Something even more valuable, obviously. The water of life? The key to all knowledge? Not quite. I'll work on it, said Polly. Um, so, yeah, Polly hangs up and realizes that this is how Mr. Leroy has gotten his revenge. That managing to get these paintings back has sort of ruined his plans, uh, his being Mr. Lynn's plans. And it has made it so that Mr. Lynn is going to have to pour all of his energy into this quartet, meaning that he won't be able to see Polly anymore the way that he had been. And I'm just dying to know what the fuck is special about Polly that he's trying to keep them apart. Like who cares? What is the deal here? I have no idea. Um, so yeah, I'm just really, I have no idea. Um, so she starts to read the fairy stories and she really is not into some of them. Like, uh, Cinderella, she finds really annoying. Um, she reads something else. Oh, here it is. The title made her blink and think a bit. East of the sun and west of the moon. It could be a way of saying nowhere, she said aloud, doubtfully. She read it, but she could not find the one true fact Mr. Lynn had assured her would be there. The girl in the story was headed, carried off by a man who was under a spell which made him a bear in the daytime. He warned her never to look at him when he was a man, but she did. Then, of course, he vanished to marry a princess, and she had a terrible job getting him back. Pointless to Polly's mind. The girl had only herself to blame for her troubles. She was told not to do a thing, and she did. And she cried so much. Polly despised her. I love that so much. Listen. I, like I said, I really love fairy stories. But is there anything more frustrating than the inevitable moment in every fairy story where somebody does a thing that they were expressly told not to fucking do? I just... Yep. Um, so then we go on to her like weird, uh, and I say weird, it's not weird at all. She got invited to a disco dance. And of course, it's her first dance that she's ever been invited to. And she gets really wrapped up in being able to dance and not making a fool of herself and everything. And it's a shame because she gets like, lessons i'm saying in quotes from nina who has become very into dancing um but it turns out that seb 
never actually like gets in touch with her and tells her when it is or asks her to go. So yeah. What's that about? Like, did he mean it when he asked her? Did he realize that it was a bad idea? Did his father like tell him you better stay the hell away from that? Like what is going on? Um, and Seb still is he. Okay. So I'm going to read this. Um, this made it rather difficult the next time she saw Seb. She kept seeing him from then on, here and there in Middleton, usually walking with tall, high and mighty looking boys from Wilton College. Should she stick her nose in the air and look offended or smile as if nothing had happened? In fact, Polly did both at once, in a confused way, the first time she passed Seb. Seb replied with a sort of wave and a sort of grin, at which the other boys looked round after her and murmured things. Polly's face went scarlet. So I feel like it's got to be in that moment that they're murmuring things to him like, oh, who's this chick? Because she's starting to get cute. But also she's still what at this point, like 12, 13, maybe she's still really young. But that is when things very, very, very start to happen. Um, like the, fir the first moments that I had of guys acting interested, I was 14. And that was the first time that I like really got what was going on. So I'm sure that it was happening earlier and I just didn't really like put it together, which is what seems to be happening with Polly here. So I guess that timing actually makes sense. Um, and then there's a description here of the fact that Polly and Nina are like friends really on and off again and that they always seem to be off track with each other in terms of their interests lining up. Polly gets interested in discos after Nina's sort of like done with them and starts to take like doing tennis. Eventually Polly gets interested in tennis, but Nina's moved on to ecology. Um, they keep on being like not friends and then friends again and not friends. And mostly because Nina just can't keep her fucking mouth shut and is like insufferable. I really liked Nina as a little girl because she was like weirdly charming with her annoying self. But as she gets older, it gets more extreme and just, really annoying to read. Um, so Polly is actually becoming like more friendly with David, um, which one would think would be something that Ivy takes comfort in that they're getting closer, but she doesn't. Um, so we'll talk about that in a moment, but first let's talk about the way that David is discussing her to Polly um, Polly had come in one day to find David roving around the kitchen like an irritated bear. The woman's a vampire, he said angrily to Polly. What does she want from life? I have to account for all my movements and every half pee these days or she says I'm being secretive. Dad let her down, Polly explained. She wants to be happy. David at this became uneasy and contrite. Shouldn't say things to you about your mother, should I? Except profound regrets and pretend it was never said, Right. Yes, but mum is difficult sometimes, Polly said, when she closes down. Doesn't she just close down, said David. You're a sympathetic wench, Polly, you know, understanding. And be and that, because of her being so understanding, David, uh, or after that, because of her being so understanding, David took to handing Polly notes secretly to be delivered to certain Irishmen on her way to school. Mr. O'Keefe was nearly always to be found leaning against the wall of the Rose and Crown. He always took the note with a huge wink and said, Thank you, my darling. Um, so, yeah, I'm assuming that this is about bets and stuff because he specifically mentions I have to account for my whereabouts and every half P. So I assume that like money is going away or something. Um, but it could be something totally other. You know, that's just like what my mind went to immediately. Um David was rather anxious about this arrangement. To cover it up, he invented a game of elaborate compliments to Polly. She's growing up so gorgeous, he would say, the silver-haired lovely of the 80s. What will she be like later if she's like this now? And I'm booked to be her father and give her away to some undeserving lout or other? Oh, Polly, I mourn. Polly supposed the compliments were meant to act like a smokescreen to distract Ivy from the notes, but they made her very uncomfortable and she wished he wouldn't. She could see they annoyed Ivy. She found she was not looking forward to the time when the divorce was at last settled and mum and David were able to get married. Um, yeah, so <laughs> what do we think of this? Because like, okay, 
this is I, I again and this is what I love about the way this is written. It's so unclear because we're in Polly's perspective and she doesn't know either. So there are ways that things are written sometimes in books where it's very clear because you are an adult reading it what's going on, but the kid doesn't get it because they're a child and they just don't understand. This is written so that it is as unclear to the reader as it is to Polly, which in some ways I frankly prefer because it makes us understand so much better how utterly perplexing this is to her and how it's like, is there something shady going on where he's like into little girls or is he just totally unable to like properly express himself in a way that's appropriate and he doesn't understand how he sounds to her? I don't know. Neither does Polly. And like, I think many girls have been in this position where there was a guy, an older man, being weird with them, and they were not sure how to take that. Like, are you being inappropriate because like, purposely because you're towing the line because you're trying to push the envelope and see how far you can go before I'll stop you and be like, what are you doing? Are you doing this because you're genuinely like, nice, but you don't really think about how this comes across or because you have an ulterior motive and you don't think about how this comes across. If people don't understand like the context of it, are you just that clueless? Like that seems unlikely. Or are you just like kind of gross and just don't know really how to talk to the females of the species. And so it always comes out being inappropriate because you just don't know how to be any other way. Um, But the, the fact that, Ivy starts to get upset by this is not that surprising. Like this is something that I have such mixed feelings on because I don't like Ivy. And the fact that she seems to like hold it against um, David that he's getting along with Ivy or getting along with Polly initially does seem really self-absorbed and like it needs to be all about me at all times. But if you were a woman and a guy was talking about, your daughter like this, your daughter who's just starting to like come into puberty. I just don't think there's any way that you don't find this upsetting in some way, right? You've got to be like, either there's something shady going on with you or what, what she thinks is that she, he's trying to like get Ivy on his side, whatever that might mean. Um, and it's much easier to think that than to think that the guy is like inappropriately interested in your daughter. So in some ways she goes for the like least mentally upsetting of the two options. And it does kind of make sense in the end. But I like, by the time I finish the section that I've read for this episode, it's not clear what she's planning to do about that. Or like what, if he understands what he's saying here and how it seems. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I have such mixed feelings about this guy because like part of me wants to like him and, and wants him to stick around just because he's like the only person other than her grandma that is in Polly's life on a daily basis that seems to care about what's going on with her and like listen to her and talk to her and do things for her. And I would like that to stick around, but not if he's going to be a fucking weirdo. So, mm, you know, um, so she gets this weird thing in the mail. It was not a proper letter. It was something folded inside a typed wrap round label. Bath Festival, Beethoven, Dovrak, Bartok, the Dumas Quartet, um, Our first decent engagement, I know I can count on you to see the joke in the name we chose. Is an Oba sipped a kind of talisman, perhaps? Um, So, yeah. And David, meanwhile, is saying, it's a languishing letter from one of her numerous admirers. Eh, Polly? Oh, David, just stop. Um, So she realizes that it's the Dumas Quartet. Uh, because the name of the um, author of The Three Musketeers was Alexander Dumas. Uh, Ale- no, Dumas was in The Three Musketeers, his character. I don't know, guys. Whatever, it's fine. Three Musketeers is not of any interest to me. <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. 
Patricia's saying it is. No, you're right. It's the author. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. Abby says, um, it's really unclear, but it all feels quite you to me. Yeah, I think that's fair. Mm hmm. Um, so let's see. She uh, reads Edward Davies, alias Tanther, Porthos. Samuel Rensky, alias Tan Hanabar, D'Artagnan. Anne Abrams, alias Tan Audel, Aramis. Thomas Lynn, alias Tan Cool. Polly smiled widely. It was a clever way to get round, Mr. Leroy. The poster must have gone out in a stack of others so that it did not look like something specially to Polly. And it was interesting to see that Mr. Lynn thought of himself as Arthos, too, even though he had not written it in. Um, so Polly goes and rereads the Three Musketeers again out of uh, respect for the group. And then she starts writing about... <laughs> I love this so much. She reads the Lord of the Rings and then she writes a story that is basically that the Obosift was really a ring, which was very dangerous and had to be destroyed. Um, yes, this is definitely a phase that we all go through when we are creative people and we're absorbing the amazing creative works of other people. You write the shit that you just read. That's just what happens. You just do that. Like, I can't tell you when the Lord of the Rings movie came out, I was currently in technical theater school at Carnegie Mellon and we had an assignment where we had to design a set and I just fucking designed the elf set, the, you know, all of the elven architecture with like the long curving lines and, and pointed archways and things that were really like elegant and slender, like drawn out. I just, that was what my sets all, I just couldn't fucking come up with my own shit i was so wrapped up in this thing that i admired and loved and didn't know how to turn that into my own thing i just replicated what i loved and that's just what you do because you're figuring shit out and that's fine um and mr lynn is a little hard on her she gets a note from him and he's like you stole that from Tok tolkien do better and i was just like jesus and he does wind up writing her and apologizing for being pretty short with her. Um, but yeah, it was a little bit just like, and she like, when she gets that, she's so mad that she like doesn't talk to him for a little while until he writes to her and is like, Hey, sorry, I was in a rush, but I do think that you have better ideas than that. And, uh, you know, you're not fooling anybody basically. Um, so, Polly goes to reply to him and she's like so paranoid that every time she goes to communicate with Mr. Lynn, that Seb is like watching and reporting to his dad, which may or may not be the case. Like in my, my immediate reaction is, wow, you are really paranoid and that's not what's going on at all. But to be perfectly honest, I have no idea if that's what's going on. There is no reason to think it's not going on because Clearly, there's something at play here that I don't understand. So why don't I think that could be it? There's no good reason, you know. Um, I just think that probably if there is some, if she is being somehow watched or kept track of, that it's not going to be Seb doing it anymore. Like, it doesn't feel like that's his deal, if it ever was. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make of this. Um, so sorry, uh, very tired in my last damaged my good cello. Forgive my criticism, but you used to have much better ideas on your own. Um, and she puts together the fact that she like saw Seb when she was sending out this letter to Mr. Lynn to the damage of Mr. Lynn's cello. Like she thinks that it is a punishment. It is such a strange connection to make. Um, but it's a, it's a, it makes sense for like a child to make that, you know what I mean? Like this is the kind of weird stuff that you, if you had been superstitious before, which she was it's not something that you just like shake right away. And this is its own kind of very particular superstition that she has. Um, but she leaves a message and uh, calls him like she calls, leaves a message on his phone saying, sorry about the cello. She put down the telephone feeling cheated and incomplete. Um, and after she makes this call, she like goes out and like looks to see if Seb is on the street and thinks she seemed to have got away with it, which is so hilarious to me. 
Uh, so she starts getting books all the time from all these different cities under all of these different pseudonyms. So whatever she thinks is going on, which with the fact that they're conversation and contact is being tracked obviously despite not having really talked that aspect of things over with mr lynn he clearly also feels that way because he's making up names and sending her stuff from like so what i don't i don't know but he's like buying into this whole idea as well um all through those summer holidays and the autumn term that followed, parcels of books for Polly kept on coming. It seemed as if every time Mr. Lynn arrived in a new shop, in a new place, almost his first act was to find a bookshop and get it to send Polly under some idiotic new name. Um, the only trouble was that all Polly seemed to be able to do in return was to ring up the robot machine in London and tell it, uh, uh, Polly, um, thanks. And to read the book, of course. Um, so then we go into second year, which is, I guess, sophomore year. Is this sec is second year sophomore? Anybody British here? Um, I assume it is, which means that she'd be. Hmm. I was like 15. In my sophomore year of high school. So she'd be 12 to 13, depending on when her birthday is. OK, so second year is not sophomore year of high school. It's like what? Eighth grade, maybe? Um, British Harry Potter years. Oh, right. I forgot that's how that goes. Because it's seven. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, senior school here starts at 11. Mm, okay. Um, so she gets a part in this play. And this, um, I'm running over time, but this won't take me too long to talk about because it's hilarious. Nina gets the lead in this play and she is insufferable. She is the biggest diva in the entire world. She wants to sing, but she's supposed to be mute in this part because it's like a, um, a pantomime and she won't, she like, you know, it's fucking Nina. She's like me. What are you going to, she's going to do, do a part where she doesn't get to talk. I doubt it. So she decides that she's going to make up a song and then just fucking sing it before he can stop her, which is amazing. And I kind of wish she had gotten to do that because I want to see her just humiliate herself. Um, but everybody's like, oh, you would never do that. Come on. And she's like, oh, yes, I will. And she decides that she's going to balance a chair on a desk and stand on it and sing and like show off. And the fucking thing comes crashing down and she breaks the project that she falls on. She breaks her glasses and she sprang her, sprains her ankle. Mr. Herring sees the opportunity to get rid of Nina. The show must go on, he said gleefully. And he made Polly Pierrot instead. Pierrot? Pierrot. Pierrot? I don't know how to say this name. Um, and Nina joins the chorus of clou clowns where she annoyed Mr. Herring considerably by calling advice to Polly all the time. Polly herself is actually having a pretty good time doing this. Um, it's interesting to me that when Nina is like kicked out of the way that it's Polly, the part goes to like, I don't know if that, if that's meant to just be that they're the ones that are like the loudest and most notable in the class, but you know, that's not, that it feels like she's got a talent that teachers can see, but Nina's always just so much more front and center that she tends to get the attention first. Um, but in, in any case, this play, like she gets really into rehearsing it. She invites Mr. Lynn. And then here comes another scene where I want to murder Ivy. You will come and see it, won't you? She said rather often. Ivy neither said yes or no. She was in a bad mood. She and David did not seem to Polly to be getting on very well. You'll have to tell me soon, Polly said two weeks before the performance. We'll be getting the tickets tomorrow. Will you shut up about that? Ivy exploded. I've told you before what I feel about your school shows. Solid boredom. But this is different, Mum. Polly persuaded. It's not a nativity. It's supposed to be what Pantos do before, uh, used before they started being Dick Whittington and things. It's more of a dance. My part's a sort of morning acrobat. 
Oh, it's Artie, is it? Ivy said disagreeably. Then definitely no. I did my bit when you were in juniors, and that's it as far as I'm concerned. Come on, Ivy. Where's the old esprit de corps? David intervened. It won't hurt to go. You keep out of this, said Ivy. I'd like to see Polly Gorgeous do her stuff, David said unwisely. I bet she's terrific. Ivy rounded on him. Gorgeous, is she? I've watched you, David. You've been making up to Polly on the sly for months now. You're always trying to get her on your side. Just leave off, will you? <sighs> Girl, like, is calling her Polly Gorgeous a good idea? Absolutely fucking not. Is him wanting to go to the fucking thing that she's asking you to go to because you're her goddamn parent a totally reasonable way to react? Yes, it fucking is. You psychopathic monster. I hate her so deeply. Ugh. I, th it's nothing but good old togetherness, Ivy. I don't want Polly to hate me. Hate you? She'd walk through fire for you these days and you know it. Wouldn't you, Polly? Oh, I wouldn't put it quite so high as that, David said. Would you, Polly? Polly stood there with Ivy looking at her angrily and David pleadingly and did not know what to answer. If she said she hated David, Ivy would be angry. If she agreed with Ivy, David would be in trouble. He's all right, she said. But what about the pantomime, Mum? Don't change the subject, said Ivy. Hear that, David? All right, she said. When Polly says a thing like that, she means it. I know, Polly. You've got her eating out of your hand and I'm not having it. That, Polly was annoyed at having her careful answer made to mean the wrong thing. That's not what I meant, she said. You don't know what goes on in my mind. Nobody does. Yes, I do, said Ivy. Better scarpered, Paul, David said warningly. That's it. Advise my daughter what to do, Ivy said. Polly took David's advice and went upstairs to do her homework. Um, so eventually Ivy comes in and s says that, uh, David's been quite honest with me and we've settled to go away for a bit together to get to know one another again. I've rung Granny and she says she'll have you till we get back. Would you mind terribly? We'll be back before Christmas, promise. That meant they were not coming to the pantomime. Polly moved her shoulders against the cistern cupboard and sighed. That'll be fine, Mum, she said nobly. Have a good time. I knew you'd say that, Ivy said, which made Polly feel rather low. She would have liked Ivy to notice how noble she was being. Yo! That's a word right there. That's the thing. That right there is the thing that gets to me, is that when you are constantly putting other people first and trying to be understanding and trying to like, then they just start to expect you to do that. And it's totally unappreciated. That one got me a little bit, guys. I'm not going to cry, but I kind of want to. Just saying. Um, so to wrap this section up, the first uh, performance where Polly uh, gets her grandma to come does not go well. It's hilarious, actually. Like, everybody's missing their cues. People's costumes are tearing. One of the girls is playing the uh, song that Polly is supposed to dance to. Uh, she She's playing it wrong and then, like, bursts into tears. There is just so much going wrong. And it's like the kids that are supposed to be going out there with, because it's a, you know, each grade gets their own performance. So there are other kids who are going out there and they have lines and they didn't learn them. So they go out there and humiliate themselves. The lights go out a few times. Like everything is just, it's fucking a disaster. And finally, um, hilarious. I just, it's so funny. Finally, uh, everybody is like so ashamed of themselves that they decide that they're going to do better the next day because it was just humiliating. It was too much. They couldn't like, there's a, there's a fine line between, well, I don't care, whatever. I'm not going to put in any effort because putting in effort isn't cool. And just outright ruining everything for yourself and others. And they all seem to realize that they've found that line and they went over it and it's time to go back. Um, so, the next night, which is the one where Mr. Lin actually shows up, um, she does amazing. Like, everything goes according to plan. She goes out there and performs her whole thing with, like, no problem. I'm just realizing now that the painting that he had to give back was of a sad clown. Oh, my God. Guys, how did I not notice that? And she's playing a sad clown right now. Guys. Guys. 
had it. Oh my god, I'm so dumb. I can't believe I didn't see that. Hello, Earth to Natasha. Anyone in there, McFly? Um, oh man. And, and I, you know what else I'd love to is that after the really bad performance when she goes home and she says to grandma, like, wasn't that awful? And grandma's just like, it was so, so actually it was kind of fun. It's fine. Um, but, oh man, I can't believe I didn't notice that. So everything goes really well. She does super awesome. And, uh, afterwards she goes outside and fucking Mr. Lynn came with Mary and I'm like, Oh, fuck. I didn't really want to believe that him and her were that serious about it. But frankly, Mary said to Polly, I wasn't too keen when Tom insisted on coming all this way. You know the way he drives, but it was worth the sacrifice, really. Ah, thanks, Polly said. She did not like Mary Fields, and she could tell Mary still did not like her, but she could tell Mary was truly meaning to be generous. She smiled warmly at her and felt the white makeup on her face crinkle. Um, so, yeah. This is like kind of a nice moment, but also a little awkward because of Mary being there. Good night, Pierrot. You were splendid, but we have to go see you. Polly stood back while the horse car started with a snarl. Um, So there's something about the way that he's just like, no, that was really good, but we got to go. I'm just like, what's going on here? Is he like worried that he's being watched himself being there? I don't know. I'm just curious about it. Um, so she heads home and fucking Mr. Leroy follows her home and like basically threatens her. Um, you keep ignoring warnings, don't you little girl? Um, Laurel, my wife is a rather special person. What's hers is hers for keeps. So to put it bluntly, keep your thieving hands off, little girl. This is the last warning you'll get. What about Mary Fields? Do you give her warnings too? Mary Fields hasn't been inside Hunson House or taken anything away from there. Polly knew then that Mr. Leroy knew all about the fire and hemlock picture and maybe about the stolen photograph, too. Um, and finally, she's she's like really getting in his face. Like, you have no right to say this to me. You don't own me. You don't own Laurel. Like, or Laurel doesn't own anybody either. Do you truly think that pendant you wear is going to keep you safe? It won't. I got its measure a while back. Now will you heed my warnings? Oh, snippity snap. The fucking pendant Polly's grandma gave her is somehow protecting her from some shit. And Polly's grandma doesn't approve of Mr. Lynn's friends. And Polly's grandma totally gave her that pendant on purpose, knowing that there was some shit going on and intending it to protect her. Like she knows something. It's very helpful, right, that I can say that she knows something. And that's as much as I've got. Um, uh, Will you heed my warning? No, said Polly. In that case, you'll regret it. You haven't even, even begun to see what can happen to you yet. You're very young. You've got angry and decided to be defiant. Change your mind. Or perhaps you don't understand. No, you don't understand, do you? Then make me understand. You say what it's all about. All right, said Mr. Leroy. We're talking about Thomas Lynn. For the third time, will you do as you have been told? No, I told you no, and I mean no. Um, so she's got more balls than I expected. And yeah, this whole thing is just such a weird situation. Like he, she says, explain it. And he just says, we're talking about Mr. Lynn. And I'm like, that's not exactly explaining it though, is it? So I have no idea. I keep saying that, but seriously, um, I went way over time guys. I'm sorry. Maybe I might want to do a slightly shorter section next time than, uh, cause this was a little bit over 50 pages, but I don't like shorting people, but also I do have two other commissions today, so I probably shouldn't be going over at this rate. Um, But yeah, this was like a really like so much is coming to light now and I'm starting to put things together, but it's still not really enough to like get a picture of what's happening. So this is what I mean about like the slow burn that it's sort of actually reminding me in some ways of like Westworld where there's all these like pieces that are all disparate for like most of the seasons. And then once they finally start together, it's been a while. 
and you're they come together and you're starting to be like oh i can't believe i didn't see that but like how could you you know you didn't have the information um so yeah i'm just i'm i'm still very interested but still baffled also i wish that i could just go and read the next section right now but i have to uh read for my next commission so i have to finish the magician's guild that's going to be the one that's coming up in a couple of hours and then after that is going to be the next section of iron druid so um well thank you again so much to patricia bing grant for commissioning this thank you to her and abby for both coming to the uh live crowdcast today i hope that you have enjoyed yourselves and um Thank you for bearing with me as I totally went over time. So I'm going to wrap this sucker up. And I believe, Patricia, that you've already commissioned the next one. So you guys will be seeing me shortly with the next episode. Thank you. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.